Good morning. Y'all are quiet today. Good morning. Yay, good. All right. God is in this house this morning. Let's stand together as we worship Him because He is holy. we can have in just celebrating his name. It just brings a blessing to our hearts when we do that. Join me in prayer. Father, as we come before you, we acknowledge your holiness. We see you, Father, as majestic and righteous. And, and there's so many, many things that we could, words we could use to express your holiness, your awesomeness, your goodness, your grace. And Father, we just say thank you for that. We thank you, Father, that we have the privilege of coming and worshiping you today. And Father, we pray today for this service. We pray for our brothers and sisters in Sunday school classes and for our visitors that are here, maybe for the first time. And Father, for those that have needs, physical, emotional, spiritual needs today, that they can be met and they'll leave here knowing that they've been in your presence. Thank you, Father, for your love you show to us in so many ways. And Father, we want to lift up your name. We want to praise you and worship you. And we do it all in the powerful, mighty, strong name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the people said? 
Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Let me just welcome you. We're so glad that you're here today, and I know that there may be some visitors that are here with us. And let me just uh, fill you in that uh, I'm kind of new here. My name is Norm. Uh, I'm new on the staff here. And um, what I found, though, is that really there are so many things going on at the Ridge that the only way I can keep track of those is through the bulletins and through some sign-up sheets and other things that we have out there. So if you're new visiting with us, then make sure that you take and read Look at some of these great things. For instance, in this next week, um, there's a, a ladies' worship time on Friday evening, and you're welcome to join in. There's a men's worship time. It's around biscuits and gravy on Saturday morning next week. And so, no, it's really just a breakfast time for the men to get together. But, but you're welcome to join in with some of those things. And so many other uh, events is taking place in the life of the Ridge Church. And so we welcome you. And, and then on the back of it, there's a little area you can pull this off uh, and fill it out and, um, and let us know. And it, and it also has in there the areas where maybe there's something that God has spoken to your heart about in the service. Maybe you want a pastor to come by and visit. Or maybe there's a prayer need or something of this sort. And so you can fill that out, and then there's a box back here. Just drop that in that. Or you can take it over as you leave uh, out the sanctuary, just to your left here. Uh, as you leave out, there's an area there where you could receive a gift that we'd like to give to you. But we're glad that you're here, and we welcome you. And if you have questions, well, then please let us know how we best uh, can, can do that. Well, you're, uh, you're in for some real blessings today. Uh, as uh, we have a variety of things taking place throughout this day, and uh, especially in this service. So I'll turn it back over to the, for our worship team, and let's just praise the Lord from our heart uh, and just worship Him in spirit and truth. Amen? Amen. One other thing I want to mention is the, uh, in the next service at 1050, the uh, children's choir is going to be presenting a musical. You might want to stick around and... And listen to that. Uh, I didn't get to make it last night, but I heard that it was really, really good. So uh, you might want to make that part of your plans today.
Is your burden weighing heavy? Is it all too much to carry? Let me tell you about my Jesus. Do you feel that empty feeling? Cause shame's done all it's stealing. And you're desperate for some healing. Let me tell you about Thank you, be seated. Are we I was eating a piece of ice, enjoying the worship. Good to see you today. If you have your bulletin, I want to encourage you to get out your sermon notes. And there'll be some blanks to fill in, but I always encourage you, as the Lord speaks to you, jot it down. It's worth writing it down and just spending some time looking at it. 
So Wednesday night, uh, Norm's going to continue a series on hearing God. Boy, what a, what a relevant uh, study. We all need to hear from God. There's just so many crazy voices out here and inside of my brain. It's always good to hear God. So I encourage you to come. It'll be at 645. We meet in the fellowship hall there. So it's kind of a relaxed setting. You can have some coffee, just kind of kick back. But again, just spend some time talking about a subject that all of us need to be reminded of. Because Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. So we need to learn how to distinguish his voice. So we're continuing our series on the Holy Spirit as I shared in the early service, I think I could go several years talking about the Holy Spirit because it really just connects to every other part of the Bible. And it really is true, and I know Norm said when he was talking about hearing God that it was the most important subject. But I just want to tell you the Holy Spirit's the most important subject. Because whatever I'm on, it seems like it's the most important thing. And I think that's the way that God designed the Bible, that really, no matter where you're in the Bible, isn't it crazy how relevant the Bible is right to where we are? I mean, it all relates. And so again, Jesus said, it's to your advantage that I go away. Because God had a better plan than walking side by side. God wanted to come and live inside of these earth suits. That really is phenomenal that the God of this universe loves you so much that he's willing to allow his spirit that knows everything about him to come and live inside of us so that we can know him on an intimate basis. And so last week I talked about the need of brokenness, something that I, I don't necessarily like talking about because I like talking about the mountaintops, but often when God wants to use our life, he takes us through a period of brokenness so that which, that which is on the inside can come out. And so I kind of compared our life to an egg. An egg has a shell, an egg white, a yolk. And the same way with us, God designed us as spirit, soul, and body. We all have an earth suit, a shell. We have a soul. We have a spirit. And like an egg, in order for that which is on the inside to come out, the outside has to be broken. And so God will use the difficulties of life, the brokenness of life, to allow his spirit to come out. And so last night, about 11 o'clock at night, this is my latest slide in my presentation. People ask me, when do you finish your sermon? Usually it's 7.59 on Sunday morning when I got to get up and preach, all right? Then I know I'm done. But Joe, our, like all these containers up here, I look around, I see a lot of different earth suits. I see a lot of different containers. But let me say this, that of all these containers, if they could all contain that river of living water, can I just tell you, it doesn't matter the size, the shape, or what the container looks like. The real treasure is on the inside. And that's what the Bible says, that God has put his treasure inside of us. And I just want to remind you, the same Holy Spirit that lives in me lives in you. We all have different containers, but again, the truth is, if that river of living water was in all of these containers, it wouldn't matter. You have the possibility to allow that river of living water to spill out everywhere you go. I just want to tell you, we're all ministers of the gospel. We all have the possibility to change lives everywhere we go because that river is in you. The river is in every believer. So I don't want you to ever believe that somehow God can use a pastor, but he can't use me. It's not true. The exact same life that's in me is in you. And so I want you to, to, to remember that and think about it. And so again, God made us, I believe, as spirit, soul, and body. And understanding spirit, soul, and body to me has helped me maybe more than any other one study because some of the verses in the Bible just don't make sense if you don't understand how God made us. But when God comes into our life, I believe that part of us, our spirit and his spirit, the Bible said, become one spirit. So you are connected to God. You know, in Romans 8, when the Bible says nothing can separate us from the love of God, the reason that's true is you are totally connected to God. Nothing's going to separate that. In your spirit realm, you cannot be closer to God. And that's why as we worship in spirit and in truth, we really are united together as brothers and sisters. So that part of us is complete. That's why the Bible says you are justified in the sight of God. Not that your earth suit is perfect, but you have a right standing relationship with God because his spirit and your spirit 
have become one spirit. The other part of us, the middle part, the soul there, that's the part of us that's in the process of becoming more like Jesus. We call it sanctification. From the moment you get saved, God begins to form in you what he began to form in me at 13 years old. He wants to make me look more, look more like Jesus. And so again, that's the process. Your soul is in the process of becoming more like Jesus. And then we have a body or an earth suit, and that part of us is wearing out. One day the body will be resurrected and glorified, but as long as you're in an earth suit, it's going to wear out. We came from dust, we go back to dust. So this morning I want to talk about that middle part of us, that part of us, the soulish part of us, that part of us that's in the process of becoming more like Jesus. And so there's a battle going on every day. Every day you get up as a believer, I just want you to know there's a warfare, a tug of war going on in your soul. And on one side, the devil wants to try to pull us to the world. He wants to try to tempt you, and he often does it through our earth suit. He wants us to think and have our mind consumed with all the stuff of this world. On the other side of that rope is the Holy Spirit. How many of you notice the Holy Spirit, the rope goes right to his mouth? Because we need to learn to trust what God is saying to us. We need to trust the Word of God. And so every day we live, there's this battle going on, and if you're mind gets sucked into the things of this world, it will affect your lifestyle. And the, the battle is real. And even though you guys look like you are so spiritual, have you ever looked around Sunday morning and felt like you were the only one that didn't have it all together? I'm just telling you, the struggle is real. Every day you get up, there's a battle going on. The Bible calls it warfare. I mean, literally, every day you get up, there's a battle in your soul. Every day, as long as you live, as long as you're in these earth suits, there's going to be that struggle. I mean, that's why some days I feel like, man, I am just so much walking with God. And then all of a sudden, the next day, I feel so ashamed. It's so crazy how we can walk with the Spirit one day, and the next day, we're walking after the flesh. But the struggle is real. And I want to be honest with you. I said the 8 o'clock service, I would rather not preach in Romans 7. I'd rather preach in Romans 8 because it's, it's the victorious walking in the Spirit chapter. But again, we're going to look in Romans chapter 7. Everybody say the inner struggle is real. Turn to your neighbor and go, the inner struggle is real. All right? And we don't like to talk about it. Can I just tell you sometimes I'm ashamed of some of the thoughts that come in my mind. Sometimes I'm ashamed at some of the decisions that I make. I tell myself, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to think that. And then I find myself falling right back in that. I'm just telling you, as long as you live, the struggle is real. And so in Romans chapter 7, but before we get in Romans chapter 7, I want to just kind of review a little bit Romans 6, all right? In Romans 6, Paul says that we are dead to sin. I mean, in the first 14 verses, I think about 15 times, he either says that we are dead to sin, or he connects us with Christ who died, buried, and rose again, and was victorious over sin. But over and over and over in Romans 6, a doctrinal fact is, you are dead to sin. All right? So let me just read a couple verses here. Let's just read them together. Uh, the first part of Romans 6, let's read together. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who have died to sin live any longer in it? And then he says in verse 11, reckon yourself to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. I like how the Amplified Bible says that. The Amplified Bible says, even so, consider yourself to be dead to sin and your relation to, to it broken, but alive to God in unbroken fellowship with him in Christ Jesus. So he says, you are dead to sin. I want to give you some good news today. The devil can't make you do it. I want to give you some great news. You are not bound to sin. The power of sin has been broken for the believer. Now, if I were writing the Bible, I would have left out Romans 7. I would have went from Romans 6 right to Romans 8. But Romans 7 reminds us that the struggle is real. Yeah, I want to tell you, you may look at a pastor and think, man, they've got it all together. But I'm telling you, anybody you see in an earth suit is going through the struggle that's real. 
Several years back, one of the pastors in the St. Louis area, probably the, maybe the most uh, successful pastor in the St. Louis area. I mean, this guy was incredibly gifted, off the charts, mega growing church. And one day he committed suicide. You say, how in the world would that be possible? I'm just telling you, the struggle is real. I don't care if it's a pastor, a deacon, a Sunday school teacher, a new Christian. I'm just telling you, every day you get up, there's a struggle going on in your soul. A struggle trying to pull you toward the world, pull you to the flesh, are walking in the spirit. Every day the battle is real. That's why Paul said, I have to die daily. I mean, he didn't just have it and always had it. I mean, it was a daily, daily battle. And so again, reminds us, a couple other verses in Romans 6. He says in verse 12, Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lust. And then in verse 14, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. I want to give you some good news. Sin shall not have dominion over you. But how many of you would be real enough to say that sometime the very thing that you're dead to, you find yourself in slavery to? That's why Romans 7, again, it's hard to preach Romans 7 because it's something we don't like to talk about. Nobody likes to talk about the struggle that's going on. Nobody likes to talk about the thoughts they have or the sin that they feel like they're stuck into. But the reality is, even though Paul says very clearly in Romans 6, you are dead to sin, in Romans 7, he finds himself in bondage to the very thing he's dead to. Now, let me say this. I've heard people quote Romans 7. And they say, well, I'm just, I'm just in Romans 7. Paul was there, I'm there, and this is just, that's just the Christian life. No. Romans 7 is not a definition of the Christian life. It maybe is a phase in the Christian life. It's a carnal stage. But if you're living in Romans 7, I want to nudge you into Romans 8. Can you imagine how miserable? Well, let's just read what Paul says. He is very schizophrenic in Romans 7. He's all over the place. But if it weren't for Romans 7, I would have never thought Paul had a setback. If you study the life of Paul, it seems like from the moment of the Damascus Road, I mean, he just literally was willing to give anything and everything to God. The guy seemed like he never had a setback. But Romans 7 reminds us that there was a point in his life that even though he was dead to sin, he found himself in bondage to the very thing he was dead to. And I don't like to talk about it. I'd rather talk about Romans 8. But I'm just telling you, inside of you, the struggle is real. I think most of us would be ashamed if our thought life came over the PA system. If our sins came over the PA system. How many of you think that'd be a fun Sunday? I'm telling you, the struggle's real. Well, let's read what Paul says. Romans 7, again, he is all over the place. And if you remember from Romans 6, we're dead to sin. But Romans 7, again, he's saying, man, I am struggling with the very thing I'm dead to. Let's see what he says. This is kind of funny to me. He says, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am a creature of the flesh, worldly, self-reliant, carnal, and unspiritual, sold into slavery to sin and serving under his control. Well, how in the world can he be a slave to something that he's dead to? Because I'm just telling you, in these earth suits, the struggle's real. I'm telling you, nothing will defeat a Christian more than to know that you're saved on your way to heaven and you find yourself living in Romans 7. It's so defeating. I'm telling you, no one wants to admit it. No one wants to talk about it. But I'm telling you, pastors struggle as much as anybody. Don't ever believe if you see somebody that they're not struggling. The struggle's real. And the reason you know it's real, if you see them in an earth suit, they're having a struggle. And one day you'll hear, Roger Johnson has died, and know that I've been freed. Woo! No more battle. <laughs> I've been free. But as long as you see my earth suit, as long as you come to church and see me here, know that the battle's real. Every day, the battle is real. Let's see what Paul says. So again, he says, I'm sold into slavery. Uh, that's the Amplified. Then he gets into this kind of schizophrenic and it's, it's kind of interesting. He says, for what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, I do not practice. What I hate, that I do. If then 
I do what I will not to do. I agree with the law that it is good. But it is no longer I who do it, but sin dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. Now, he didn't say in me nothing good dwells because the Spirit of God lived in him. But in the flesh, that part of him, nothing good dwelt. He says, for to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. For the good that I will to do, I do not do. The evil I will not to do, that I practice. Now, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. The very thing he said we're dead to, all of a sudden he says, I find myself in bondage to. I've heard Christians use Romans 7. I've actually heard Christians say, well, I'm just like Paul. I'm living in Romans 7. That's sad. Can I tell you, this is not a definition of Paul's life. If you study the life of Paul, he did, it would not be summarized by Romans 7. It would be more summarized by Romans 8. But I'm just telling you, he's saying, and notice uh, someone counted, I didn't count depending on the translation, but someone counted 47 times in chapter 7, he says, I, 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 me, me, my, I, I, I. Let me tell you what I believe. And if you ever study Romans 7, there's probably as many opinions about Romans 7 as any other chapter in the Bible. And I'm going to give you one more today, my opinion. Romans 7 is all about trying to live the Christian life in your own strength. And I just want to tell you, man, I can't tell you how many uh, sermons I had as a young pastor. Do more, try harder, do better, do better. And I'm just telling you, no matter how hard you try to live the Christian life in your own strength, you will fail. The Christian life is not difficult. It's impossible in the flesh. God never intended for you to live one day just doing the best you can. And even the Apostle Paul, as great as he was, maybe the greatest missionary ever, he said that when I try in my own strength, I fail. Can you imagine how miserable it would be to live in Romans 7? The things you don't want to do, you're doing. The things you should do, you can't do. Can you imagine telling a young Christian, man, I'm glad you're a Christian now because now everything you don't want to do, you're going to do things you shouldn't do. You'll do things you want to do, you can't. Wouldn't that be crazy to tell a young believer? That is not the definition of a Christian life. But what it is is a reality that we as Christians who are on our way to heaven, the struggle is real in our soul. And somewhere we've got to come to the end of ourself. Somewhere we've got to realize it's not me trying harder. It's not me doing more. But somehow I've got to yield to God and begin to walk in the Spirit. I want to tell you the struggle's real. And it's a shame that we haven't talked about it. It's a shame that we haven't really talked to people because, again, we, we feel ashamed of, of our thought life. We feel ashamed of things that we're bound to. But as long as you're in your earth suit, the struggle will be real. And so, again, Paul, and I'm glad Romans 7 is there because it's reality that even the apostle Paul, as great as he was, he went through a period of his life that he was trying to live the Christian life in his own strength. I want to tell you one thing we all have in common. My earth suit is no better than your earth suit. My ability to live the Christian life in my own strength is no better than your ability. The truth is, we all have to tap in to the Holy Spirit. And if someone says to you, well, I'm just in Romans 7. I'm just living there. That's where Paul was. I, I, nudge him into Romans 8. Woo, Romans 8 is about being walking in the Spirit, being filled with the Spirit. One of the greatest chapters in the Bible on the Holy Spirit is Romans 8. So if you find yourself in Romans 7, I just want to tell you there's hope because there's Romans 8. We're going to talk about that next week. Woo, that's going to be fun. I like Romans 8. I don't like Romans 7. Because it's hard to be transparent about the struggle that goes on in our life. So he goes on to say this, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. He gives us several terms here I just want to look at real briefly. First of all, the word wretched. It's only used twice in the New Testament. Once is to the church at Laodicea where they said they had it all together. He says you're wretched. 
The word wretched there means enduring trial, miserable, exhausted from battle. I like that. How many of you have ever just been exhausted in the Christian life? Man, some days I don't want to do it again. There's been Sundays I didn't want to come to church. I'm just being honest. People tell me I just wanted to stay home today. I get it. There's days I didn't want to come to church. And if I didn't have to preach, I wouldn't have been here. I'm just telling you the struggle is real. But God is wanting us to know that we cannot depend on ourselves. We have to yield to the Holy Spirit. We all have that in common. And it's a shame that we have to go around looking like we've got it all together. Well, I'm just telling you, there's not a person you, you run into that doesn't have an inner struggle going on every, week, every day. But God is teaching us while we're in these earth suits how to trust him, how to walk in the spirit, and how to die to self. It's a daily process. And then he, he describes his body, I like this, as a body of death. The uh, complete Jewish Bible says this body bound for death the Amplified Bible says this corrupt mortal existence. The New Living Translation says this life dominated by sin and death. Yo, know, you're living in a body of death. The body is going back to dust. But as long as we're in this body, the struggle is real. I mean, it's a struggle going on every day. There's a tug of war between being pulled to the world and the flesh and being pulled to the spirit. And I just want to tell you, the Spirit is always 100% for God. And if you can learn to distinguish the Holy Spirit's leading and, and, the, and the flesh, obviously we need to learn to walk in the Spirit. But it's a process. It's a process. I'm 65, uh, 66 years old. I should have made it. How many of you think, I should have got it together by now, but every day I get up, the struggle is real. It's real. And we shouldn't judge people. We shouldn't look down. I'm just telling you, the struggle is real. The struggle is real. The word carnal there is an interesting word. By the way, a person who's carnal is still a Christian. The term is not used for unbelievers. It, the word carnal is a baby Christian. They're a Christian that's kind of stuck in their growth process. All right, the word carnal there comes from the, the root of it is sarks, pertaining to the flesh, bodily, temporal, unregenerate, controlled by human nature instead of the spirit of God. You remember the church at Corinth, Paul called them carnal. You remember that? And listen to what he said about the church at Corinth. I speak to you as carnal, as babes in Christ. A carnal Christian is a Christian, but they haven't grown up. Now let me say, let me just remind you guys about a baby. How many of you know babies can't take care of themselves? Babies have to be fed. Babies have to have their diaper changed. Babies have to have 100% care. And a new Christian, it's okay to be a baby Christian when you're a new Christian because they need to be fed. They need to be loved. They need to be nurtured. They need to be encouraged. But at some point, you need to get away from childish things and you need to be able to feed yourself on the Word of God. But a carnal Christian just never grows up. They're always dependent on somebody spoon-feeding them. He goes on to say, I fed you with milk and not with meat. How many, what, can I just give you all a compliment? I don't see anybody sucking on a baby bottle today. Woo, we got through that stage. But spiritually, I'm telling you, spiritually, I know Christians that don't know how to take the Bible and just feed off of it every day. They, they're dependent on other people. And it's okay when you're a new Christian. But somewhere we need to grow up. Somewhere we need to grow in the Word of God. He goes on to say there's envy, strife, and divisions. How many of you have ever been to a church that's just full of division, envy? I'm telling you, that's a carnal church. Woo! I, I don't want to be around a lot of baby Christians. We need to be growing up into the things of God. But Romans 7 is a carnal state. It's where we're kind of stuck in the Christian life, all right? And so I have came across this uh, toad, and Norm said they had these in Papua New Guinea, but there's a toad in Australia and apparently in other places called the cane toad, and they literally puts off a secretion that's poisonous. And they say that dogs, and dogs, how many of you know dogs will eat anything? 
Dogs are gross. I had a little, we had a little poodle named Buffy, and, and when we were eating as a child, Thanksgiving, everybody came over to eat, and anything I didn't want in my plate, I just put down, Buffy would eat it. Just kind of slide it down there, onions, broccoli. One day we were eating Thanksgiving meal, and we had that, how many remember back in the 70s, 60s, 70s, that big shag carpet? Man, that was cool back then. But anyway. Oh, Buffy, after, after eating all kinds of things, went over to the shag carpet and just, Bleh! I mean, you know, when you're eating Thanksgiving meal, that's rough. What's worse than that, Buffy, after she threw up in the shag carpet, she started to walk away, then she turned and looked at it and said, she went back and ate it. You say, you got a verse for that? The Bible says, as the dog returns to his vomit, so we sometimes return to sin. I'm just telling you. But dogs, they, they'll lick these toads. And they become addicted to the very thing that's killing them. They literally become addicted to this toxin. And if they lick enough of it and put it in their mouth, literally it can kill the dog. And I want to tell you, that's how sin is. Sometimes we become addicted to the very thing that's killing us spiritually. We keep going back and we keep going back and we become addicted to a certain sin in our life when it's killing us. It's crazy. And so this is a slide. This took me about six or seven hours. And you'll, you'll, after you look at it, you'll think, what took so long? Anyway, so just trying to visualize everything, we come to Christ, John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So once we get saved and we leave the lostness behind, we begin to be a work in progress. And let me just give you my opinion, 100% of people that are truly saved are going to make it to heaven. I don't believe you can be saved, lost, saved, lost, saved, lost. Because when the Spirit of God comes to live inside of you, I think He's with you forever. Now, there's two ways to live the Christian life every single day, only two ways. One, we can live in the Spirit, we can walk in the Spirit, or we can walk after the flesh. And this was a revelation I got after I printed my notes, and so I want you to see Spirit there. How many of you notice that Spirit is divided, all right? And so we're either walking in the Spirit, how many of you know the feet are in the Spirit, or the feet are after the flesh, I did too many silver saints mind stretchers. So we're either walking in the spirit or we're walking after the flesh. Every day the struggle is real. We're either walking in the spirit and trusting the spirit or we're allowing the flesh to control us. And I'm just telling you, I don't care how spiritual you look on Sunday, the struggle is real. And I'm telling you, the most spiritual people I know struggle. And sometimes we live in victory. The next day we can be defeated, get sucked into the world. I mean, it's an ongoing battle every single day. But God is teaching us how to trust. Now, if we're walking in the Spirit, I believe the Bible says we're, our life's going to bear fruit. Every day you walk in the Spirit, your life will bear fruit. But if you're walking after the flesh... I kind of look at that part of the Christian journey as a rest area. How many of you have ever stopped at a rest area when you're on a trip? And rest areas can be helpful. But when you're on the Christian journey, I just want to tell you, every time you get into Romans 7 and you're trying to live the Christian life in your own strength, you're not making any progress in your, in your walk with God. You're not making any progress becoming more like Jesus. So I want you to think of Romans 7 as a pause in the process. Every day you live in Romans 7, man, you become defeated to the very thing you're dead to. I'm just telling you, you're not making any progress. That's when you become a carnal Christian, and that's where Romans 7 is right there. So Romans 7 is a pause in the process. Doesn't mean you're not saved, doesn't mean you're not on your way to heaven, but you're not making any process. You're not, you're not growing in Christ. We have to learn to walk in the Spirit and allow that river of living water to spill out. So I want to add just a couple things over here on the side, baby stuff. Nothing is worse than being in a carnal church. How many of you have ever been in a church that literally was divided? I mean, there was just so much carnality. 
Doesn't mean they're not Christians. I'm just telling you, God wants us to walk in the Spirit. God wants us every day to not depend on ourselves. Romans 7 is all about you trying to live the Christian life in your own strength. But Romans 8 is all about the Holy Spirit. If you get stuck in Romans 7, I want to give you some really good news. Keep reading, because Romans 8 is next. I want to live in Romans 8. I want to live with no condemnation. I want to live in the power of the Spirit. It's for every believer. So let's get some takeaways, some final thoughts. It's impossible to be sinless, but it is possible to sin less. You should be making progress. If you find yourself stuck in the same thing you were stuck in five years ago, you're stuck in Romans 7. You got to get out of that. You got to make progress, all right? Jesus said in John 15, I think I quote this every morning, two verses I quote every morning when I get up, John 15, 5, without me, Jesus says, you can do nothing. I just want to give you some really good news that without Christ, it's impossible to live the Christian life. The Christian life is not you trying harder, it's not you doing more, it's realizing you can't do it. You cannot live the Christian life in your own strength. Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. And the verse we love to quote, Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So without him, you can do nothing. Yet through him, the sky's the limit. Every single day, God is trying to teach us to walk in the Spirit. And here's the last verse I want to hit today. Paul says in Galatians 5, walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Yeah. I just want to tell you, it's possible, and preachers like to preach against the flesh. And I could preach for years about the different aspects of the flesh. But if you try to conquer the flesh in your own strength, you will fail every single time. But Paul says, if we can just teach people to walk in the Spirit and depend on His power, if you walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Why are we not teaching our young people how to walk in the Spirit? They can't always be with us. But if they can walk in the Spirit, I'm telling you, they're going to have victory over the flesh. Well, I mean, in my younger days, I had some great messages. I had the most unbelievable one, two, three, how to do it messages. I was amazing. But how many of you know none of them worked? There are no three easy steps to live the Christian life. You have to die to self. You have to yield to the Holy Spirit. I'm 66 years old. I should have made it by now. I'm telling you, as long as you're in your earth suit, the struggle is real. Don't feel ashamed. Don't feel like maybe Satan will whisper in your ear. You know, if you think that, you're probably not saved. I'm telling you, Satan will work. Isn't he a rascal? He tempts us to fall, and then when we fall, he beats us up. I'm just telling you, carnal Christians are Christians. They're on their way to heaven. They're just not making any progress. If you have your bulletin this morning, there's a part of it here. On the tear-off part, there's a big eye. I want you to see that. If you have a bulletin, I want you to tear off the eye. And I want you to, to use it this week as a bookmark. Because every day you get up, the struggle will be real. Every day you're going to struggle between self and spirit. And I just want you to think about, maybe put it on your bathroom mirror or on your refrigerator where you'll see it every day. If we could just teach people how to walk in the Spirit, I'm just going to tell you, no matter what the flesh is they're struggling with, they're going to be victorious. I think a new Christian, one of the first things they need to be taught is how to walk in the Spirit, how to trust the Spirit and not their own flesh. Let's stand together. With your head up and eyes open, I know there's those watching by way of stream. I wonder how many of you would be honest enough to say that as we're talking about the struggle on the inside, how many of you would be honest to say that God pointed out something in my life that I've, I've been bound to? I know I shouldn't be bound to it. I know I shouldn't have those thoughts. 
but I find myself still thinking it. Could be anger, jealousy, resentment, bitterness. How many of you would be honest enough to say there's something God put his finger on in my life? Now, I'm just telling you, if you don't have your hand up, you will by noon today. I don't like talking about Romans 7. I do not like talking about that struggle. But it's real. And we beat ourselves up. But as long as you're in your earth suit, that struggle will be real. The good news is, as a Christian, God wants you to walk in the Spirit. Whew. I want to give you good news, man. God wants to use every vessel here. Let's just take a minute. If you're here today, just need somebody to pray with you or pray for you. If you want to slip out and come and just sit here at the front, we'll have somebody pray with you. You don't have to share anything. I think most of us would be ashamed if people knew what we were really thinking. I'm just telling you, God knows. I'm glad Paul wrote Romans 7. As much as I hate it, it's real. It is a struggle. If you're here today and you're not sure that you have Christ in your life, I can't imagine. Can you imagine living one day just doing the best you can? Because you're not going to do it. The only way we please God is when we confess we can't do it. God knows you can't do it. That's why Jesus died. That's why the Spirit came to live inside of you. He's given you the power. I just want you to just to feel God love on you today. I can't imagine one person walk out, walking out of here and just saying, man, I just, I just want to be in Romans 7. I believe every Christian desires to be in Romans 8, living the abundant life of the Spirit. Let me pray for you. If anyone does need prayer or you want to stick around, I know we'll be in the back. We would love to take time to pray with you and pray for you. I just want to give you some encouragement. Again, the battle is real. I just want you to understand all of hell is trying to get you from walking in the Spirit. And Satan's pretty good at it. But God loves you. Let me pray for you. We're going to close out with a song. The children's uh, musical will be during the 1050. So if you can stick around, I know you would be blessed by that. If you feel comfortable, maybe to raise a hand or two hands as a little child reaches up to his mama or papa. I just want you to reach up to God with childlike faith. And just say that without Jesus, we can do nothing. Yet through Christ, we can do all things. Father, I pray you would reach down to each of your children. Just love on them. And God, you know more than anyone how I struggle in Romans 7. It's a daily, daily, daily struggle. But thank you for allowing us the process of dying to self and yielding to your spirit. Father, I pray that each one here would walk in the spirit every day. That we would not fulfill the lust of the flesh, but that river of living water would spill out everywhere we go and minister life. Father, just love on each of your children. In Jesus' name, amen. He makes a way where there ain't no way. Rises up from an empty grave. Ain't no sin that he can't save. Let me tell you about my Jesus. His love is strong and His grace is free. And the good news is I know that He can do for you what He's done for me. Let me tell you about my Jesus and let my Jesus change your life. Amen. Let's spread the word.